and welcome to the Little Minds Big Ideas podcast with the Early Years Network. We are about another Monday rolls around. Another Monday. Another Monday. Another weekend buzz it does. <laughs> so it does. Um, we've got a bit of an all over one today, haven't we? We kind of want to reflect on last week, which was Mental Health Awareness Week. Yes. Probably that last week. Last week. Well, it is this week. Oh, People are listening on Monday. Why do me every, every time. time? Every single time. People are listening in the future. Oh, that blows my mind every time. Yeah. Um, Even though I'm the person who deals with it all and puts it on to, um, you do, yeah. on to ACAST and submits it, yeah. Anyway. Mental. Um, so last week for you guys, this week for us, uh, is Mental Health Awareness Week. So we kind of just wanted to do a bit of a summary on that, mm -hmm. really, didn't we? Um, with the class that's gone up and our own mental health, how we deal with things, how we can help children deal with things. And there's like a um, loose string, isn't there? Mental health is sort of yeah. guiding all this together. Exactly. Um, and then social media is going to come into it as well because that is massive when it comes to yes. mental health. Um, but to kick us off, we we sometimes like to touch upon current news, things that are going on. Education and the wider world yes. of education. Educational news. Um, <laughs> and something that I hadn't really, hadn't really got, like in, I hadn't really looked at it really until Thursday, love last week for you guys when I was listening to Radio Two, and Good old Jeremy Vine. Jeremy Vine was discussing um, the ban of sex education for children under nine. Now, this doesn't really go as they're not as young as early years, but I think some of the topics of the conversation were really really interesting, and I would love to know what everyone's thoughts are on this. Because I can't remember when I learned about sex education. The only the class I remember vividly was secondary school. I remember that class. No, I seven. definitely remember asking a question about periods in primary school. But I don't know what the context. Maybe is it around. sticks out more for girls because you learn that. Can I, can I say that? Is that, is that something you can say? On the but but do you know what I mean, I, I, feel, I feel like boys just snigger about it because it's about boobies and vaginas and sex. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? Maybe. That's why I remember it probably so well in secondary school. Maybe. Um, but oh, can you imagine how awful that must be for teachers having to sit a group of boys down in year seven and talk about sex? I find it hilarious. Maybe we were just immature. <laughs> maybe, maybe they're maybe, better now. Oh. Yeah, maybe it's just me. <laughs> um, so yeah, children under nine won't learn about it. Now, I'm not sure that age is currently at. Like, nine to me does seem quite young. But when you listen to parents on this show, they were talking about how their children at ages of six and seven were asking questions mm. about their bodies and things and all that's going on. It feels to me like it's weighing up two sides of it. Like you've got protect their innocence versus... Educate them. Educate them because of the severity. Like protect their innocence on one side of the spectrum and on the other side of the spectrum is trying to save them from abuse, neglect and then be able to verbalise... What is going on, yes. Now, what that is one of the arguments actually is that um, when a child isn't introduced to sex education and doesn't know about consensual sex or rights and wrongs and things like that, that they're more likely to have suffer abuse because they don't know that it's not wrong. Boundaries and neglect. But then it was the other side of that actually, like you've said, let children be children, that they don't need to know the ins and outs of it. But then the teacher's arguments of we're not asking children at the age of seven to sit down and put condoms on bananas. We're talking about, that's what she said on the radio. Um, we're talking about the body, how puberty changes, yeah. menstrual cycles, periods and things like that. And it's more about the biology than let's teach children how to have sex. Why, what's the difference like in the grand scheme of things of children in terms of understanding words, talking about your foot, your elbow, your penis, your vagina, exactly, your toes, yeah. your nose. Like it is just body parts at the end of the day and as a society, we sort of need to get over the fact of calling it. You hear some weird names well, in the world. I've so it's, much. And that, to be honest with you, makes me feel more uncomfortable than yeah. talking to a child and saying the word vagina or penis. Like, it's a word and that's the, that's the anatomy exactly. that we all have. Let's yeah. stop being so strange about it and calling it your fluffy cloud or whatever. <laughs> that's weird. a new one. I've not heard that before. <laughs> fluffy cloud. What did you say the other day? What did you say? They were Some, saying? like a lot of people say, like nunny. The hell's a nunny? A nunny, or I thought nunny, if I, flower, or something like. If that. I heard a child talk about nunny, I would assume they mean like some sort of rag or something they've got. Yeah, or their like, nanny. Yeah, I would never think they're talking about their vagina. It depends on the context, I suppose. I suppose, but do you know what I mean? Like yeah. that's the day. But somebody was saying on Instagram, 
I think she was a social worker or legal, something to do with that. And she was saying how uh, cases actually um, and prosecution fails on wording. Yeah. So when he called to a witness stand and terms like none are being used, people, offenders are actually getting off as a as a result of it because yeah. it's not it's not clear what, or point what blank what we're referring to, or, what the references, you know. like legal jargon gets in the way and suddenly a perpetrator gets off when in reality, if we're using proper words yeah. and the child could say he touched my vagina, then boom. Do you know what I mean? We're it's out of sealed and the guy gets put away. Remember I say I guy, first, sorry, person, person, guy, girl, whatever it yeah. might be. Um, I remember when I first started training and they taught you about safeguarding and the um, one of the examples they used for the fact that people teach their children all sorts of weird and wonderful like things for their private parts was um, a little girl who would tell their educators that with their grown-up, they played with, he had a train and they played with the trains going through the tunnels. Didn't think anything of it because they just were playing were playing, and just talked about trains going through tunnels, like you've got toys. But she actually meant that he was using his penis or his hands to... That's right. Yeah. Okay. But nobody had picked up on it because of the words really? that were being used. And they always said, like, you, you've got to encourage parents to use... Real terms. Real terms, because that's where, like you say, things get lost and the people slip through the system and children continue to be abused when they are trying to tell somebody what's going on, even though they're not sure of it themselves. I mean, it's weird. It's weird how using proper termin like proper terminology is so jarring. Like yeah. it's weird how that happens. Like it's weird how there's this stigma across society, whereas if you're a grown man and you refer to a little girl having a vagina or whatever and you use that terminology around children that that scene is weird yeah. yet creating strange metaphors it's interesting it. it's because acceptable. if a little boy was to call their penis their willy everyone would know what they were talking about whereas for a vagina there isn't a child friendly term no, that it could be used yeah it becomes fanny a, and the yeah. P word and things like that that exactly. becomes quite vulgar yeah so there's not actually that's why but for girls, it tends to go down the road. Yeah. Flower, like whatever it might be. But why teaching a child vagina is such a big deal, I don't I don't really know. I remember once one of my colleagues was pregnant and um, mum had obviously been talking about pregnancy at home, whatever, and the child said to her, oh, um, the child's going to come out of your vagina. And we were like, yeah, yeah, you're right. Like, I'm not going to lie to this child. It's not, it's got to get out somehow. But she brought the conversation up. To well, but then we could have gone, you could have started talking to her about um, what's called when you have surgery. C-section. C-section. Yeah. That was a chance there, Emily, for further learning. You could have really enhanced that child's I was, <laughs> pregnancy. I could have done, yeah, but under nines now, they're not allowed to know. Um, well, but anyway. C-section count as the band of <laughs> Probably. Um, but yeah, I think it's, I just wanted to touch upon it because I want to know everyone's thoughts and opinions on it. I don't have a child. Right. I don't live with a child full time, so I don't know when they would begin to ask questions. I don't remember myself when you start asking questions about these sorts of things. Do you think the word sex education is the wrong label? Yeah. Because sex education in primary school, to me, I mean, I immediately think, well, yeah, I get on board with that. It's a bit weird to be talking sex education because like, we shouldn't really be teaching primary school children about shagging. No. And that's like sort of what it when sounds it, like. It yeah. To, yeah. But in reality, it should sure, surely just be part of the biology. Human biology yeah. should be what it is. And we be. should be making sure there's elements of safeguarding in biology as a as a part of the curriculum. Yeah. And then it talks about into secondary schools where they um go into the like the safeguarding side of things, things like upskirting. Yep. Um and it kind of goes further into consent and things like that, which I understand because to, uh, teenagers are can become sexually active and they well, well, need to be in control of their own bodies. In sex ed, I, I would assume, has some sort of cyber um, reference now. Like, yes. Because of online. Yeah, I mean, I remember when I was Grooming in school. Grooming as well is on there, yeah. I remember when I was in school, there was a whole case of, because um, when I was growing up, we sort of came with the wave of smartphones and stuff. And when we were in year seven, it sounds so weird, and I'm going to handle it, I wasn't involved in any way, shape, or form. Um, but there was a group of lads in our year, in year seven, eight-ish, who put together what was later dubbed the Golden Folder, which is basically nude images that they collected oh, girls. of yeah. girls from our year. And, and there was nothing, that uh, sounds majorly seedy, but it was all somewhat solicited. The fact they shared them was probably not solicited, blah, yeah. blah, blah. Anyways, this folder got sort of created in year seven and eight, and it was a collection of, I don't know, probably about 15 to 20 girls Gosh. from 
our year group and stuff. And I think some from the year below and year above. Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, this folder resurfaced when we were in... Da, 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 trying to think of the guys involved, some of them didn't go to six months. And when we were in year 11, I think, it resurfaced for whatever reason. And obviously the girls were still our age. Year 11, how old are you in year 11? So maybe it was six months because of the age thing. Anyway, when it resurfaced, obviously the girls were... Underage. There you go. So even though they're in our year, when the image was taken, they were like 13, 14, whatever. Oh, it might be. Wow. So like, and, and, it, and then it also turned out in the time, over the time being that took place, one of the girls had also left our school and had gone into like, she'd, um, I think she'd been diagnosed with something. So she was like protected, if that made sense. So it made it even like 10 times even worse because she was uh, classified as vulnerable. Adult, yeah. So then the police had to get out and the lads involved, luckily... It, because of it was just really poor decision makings rather than yeah I, guess. I think the police sort of took it as like this is really massively really serious. serious but I mean some of the girls in the folder and the guys were actually like friends in school like it, because of the time had gone on yeah. and stuff so it didn't really press me it made it more serious because the one individual I mentioned who had then become like had gone into whatever and made it more serious for vulnerability reasons etc yeah. uh, and in the end they got a really 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 hard slap on the wrist and weren't put on some sort of sex register, which could have been really, really detrimental yeah. for them over stupid I guess at the states. time, they were the same age when it was taken. Yeah. The fact that it would come back, it was it's not like they'd taken pictures of 13-year-old no. girls. So yeah. I think, I think yes, obviously, if, they, if they'd have been that, that age, and that, then the a different, different kettle of fish. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was just one of, of these elk of things that yeah. just made me think, you know, Cyber and all this understanding is really, really important because you can ruin your life if you send a photo, even if you think at the time. Yeah. You've got to be careful what you do out there. And Online. I think when you put something out on the internet, never. Or a phone or whatever, they're forever. I mean, we're going to talk about social media later, but yeah. I just thought it was a. Um, that was kind of just the current news that we all wanted to drip in there for the, for the start of the podcast. Let us know your thoughts. I mean, from an early year's perspective. It's we talked weird, about bodies it? and naming body parts and things and toilet training and safety and. We always talk about with, I know specifically with preschoolers, it's like your body is your body. And at that age, they are curious. They all stand in the bathroom together and <laughs> they want to, what, what, what pants have you got on? Because they want to show off their Disney pants or whatever. Oh, it reminds me though of uh, Billy Elliot. Like, I'll show me, I'll show you mine. Show you show mine. <laughs> oh, that was the direct quote. Um, he's like, no, you're all right, thanks. <laughs> um, but I think, Not my cup of tea, love. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, all right, see you. Um, but I think it's interesting because, yeah, at that age in preschool, they are curious, but it's always a reminder of they are yours, they're for you and your safe people and things like that. But it's strange how, like, in early years, I hope we are using correct terminology around yeah. children and helping them and to understand and label, et cetera, et cetera. But it's weird how then they go to school and it's like, oh, actually, teachers, that's illegal. <laughs> you can't continue. Can't so what that. we're doing is technically, and then when you get to primary school, that's illegal. Yeah, we can't talk about that. You to get yeah. nine. Yeah. Unless they're gonna, like, maybe we we will get something later. But by the way, guys, you can't use these words. Oh, but yes, yeah, so that is that's what I just wanted to put in there. So let us know. Talking point for today was that okay? Then cool. Mental health. Yeah. So mental health awareness week has been going on. I think it's really important to talk about mental health. I think everybody deals with mental health in some aspect, whether they realise it or not. Yeah. They deal with mental struggles. Might not even be your own, but you with someone or you know someone Colleagues. who's going through something. Yeah. What's your view on awareness weeks as a whole? I struggle with awareness weeks because I think it's something that should be it's not I guess talked about all the time, this, but it's something that happens every day for everybody. Some people I don't know what I'm trying to I say. I find it a hard one because it's I find I, it's fifty fifty, because I think it's great that things get highlighted. Mm. But then I also feel like what, do we just now forget about it for the next 51 weeks of the year? Yeah, until, and it, until it comes around, around. Next time, yeah. And it just sometimes it feels a little... Uh, Forced. False as well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, it's a little like, oh, we're just going to... Like, you see all the big companies doing awareness weeks, we're going to go for walks and stuff, and they do, go extra effort for men's health. It's like, well, what, why aren't you doing things... Like, why don't you work hard to find things you can do consistently to help people's mental yeah. health rather than just, like, token gestures? Yeah, I know. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I it's like me, virtuous yeah. in a bit, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but... We wanted to touch on the new class that's on the site. Will it be up by Monday? It'll be up, uh, yeah, yeah, it's going to go up today. So today's Friday, so. Yeah. yeah with the virtual thing that we have a mental health class. <laughs> yes. Um, so the new mental, positive mental health class. And I wanted to call it positive. And we talked about this before I filmed it and the angle that I wanted to take the episode, the episode, the class in. 
was that I want to personally when I think of mental health I think of the negatives yeah we fixate on the we doing fixate on the yeah whereas actually creating a positive mental health was the way I wanted to see it It'd be more useful I suppose yeah and it's all about helping children to well, helping us as adults to help children to build a positive mental health so what can we do to recognize signs and symptoms of positive and negative mental health um, what can we do to help the brain to release those positive chemicals? What situations can we help children be a part of? When negative emotions arise, what can we do to support them in co-regulation and things like that? Um, your class all on co-regulation is a massive one that supports mental health as well because when children can understand and recognise emotions and deal with them, the like, quicker the less toll it's going to have on their mental well-being and things. Yeah, it's, I mean, even emotions is an interesting one about mental health, isn't it? Because a lot of it comes down to that terminology of emotional granularity, so your ability to describe how you feel in your emotion. Because I saw a study where it suggested like 90-odd percent of adults would struggle to explain the difference between anxiety and depression. Yeah. Like, how does it actually make you feel what do you feel is the difference and anybody yeah. who explains that will always be correct because it's always individual to how, how you feel you can't say to someone oh this is how i feel when i'm depressed but like, i actually know that's not depression <laughs> out you go like it's just it's not how it works so it's all about how you and the language you're able to describe and also what you link with in terms of your own interception so like how your body feels yeah um and also your experiences in life as a concoction will formulate how you can describe depression, anxiety, yeah, or just sadness. emotions in general, yeah. yeah. Um, and that's what I touch upon in that class is that actually sometimes a lot of people say we should talk out loud and we should help children to hear different feelings. And I'm oh and I totally agree with that. I don't like to label emotions for children. I don't I would never I don't want to tell someone they feel sad. Mm. Because like you've just said, they might not feel sad. Um or is it like, are you feeling sad? Do you feel like, have you got that feeling in your tummy? Do you feel like you want to cry? Like, all those different things. But, but even interestingly, like, if you described, if I asked people to describe when you feel like you want to cry, what emotion do you feel? Oh, people, all of them for me. But that's what I mean. Like, it's so like... Oh, no, I just use that as an example. Like, last like, night, I was at the football. And I was really, like, nervous at the beginning. But then I got really emotional, like, because of everything that was going on. And then I was really happy. Like, and, But all of those could have triggered, like... They did for crying. Me. Like, do you know what I mean? Then that's why. It... And I was sat at home sending Ben pictures of me crying at the TV, like, oh my God. But that's why when we talk about emotional fingerprints, in essence, they're not universal. They don't actually exist. Everyone no. can have their unique individual fingerprints, I suppose. But in the grand scheme of things, and that's why when we use these face cards for children in early years, yeah, it's a great way to teach them the social norms around emotions and the universal sign of happy being the happy face. But that happy face, no one actually, like, if I sat here when I'm happy, I'm, <laughs> you think I'm a psychopath <laughs> it's interesting because with that one it's always uh, those emotion cards are really good to I think because well, I do have some in the class there are downloadables but I think they're really good well, <laughs> I wasn't just I wasn't don't um... slate my cards <laughs> thank you very much um, I think they're really good when children are up here and they can't pick which emotion they're at so they're a good visual to be like okay well what how would you best describe how you feel? Happy, sad, angry, excited, tired, hungry, like whatever it is. Um, they're a good way to bring them down. But then when you're just having like a discussion on feelings, it's always like, what makes you feel happy? And a lot of the time people will say, like my family, playing with this person, doing this. And that's a nice way to talk about what makes them feel happy. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's because words are almost that bridge that give feeling inside your body and your cognitive functioning, like, it's almost that link. Yes, yeah. Like words act as that link, like, well, this is how I feel in this scenario, and in the past, my experience is this experience, this experience, this experience, and your body then obviously goes through, like, a predictive model as your brain, and mm. you figure out, in, within milliseconds, what it is you're what it is you're feeling. Yeah. It's the words that then give that freedom. Well, I had a nursery manager, actually, who's used the printout cards already, because I, I have sent them out and tested them on with different settings in different oh, ways. And little guinea pigs. Yeah. Um, and she said that they were, like, it was really useful because on the cards, there's two or three questions at the bottom to prompt the practitioner to be able to say something in response to that emotion. 
So if a child is feeling um, excited, one of the questions is, how can we get that excitement out? Like, what do you want to do? So you could be jumping, you could stomp, you could do star jumps, you could run around. Like, what is it you're going to do? Same with anger. How can we get that anger out of you? Mm. Or if they said they pick the tired one, one of the cards is, do you feel you need to have a rest? Just because someone feels tired doesn't mean they need to lie down and sleep. That might make them more agitated. But if you're just feeling like, oh, I just feel tired today. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So those little questions are a really good prompt for educators to actually reflect on what they're saying to children. And I touched upon this in an Instagram post because we, our first thing that we say to children with any emotion that they show is, you're okay. Yeah. You're okay. Fine, get on with it. And you're fine, get on with it. There was a comment on the TikTok video, I think it was, that, of that video. And someone said that in their baby room, a lot of the time, the staff would just say, oh, you're just being silly. But a baby's but, not being silly. To, but to be fair to that individual, I think it's something we can all do without even thinking. Can, like oh, it's all such, guilty of it. We are such, all guilty of it. Such a norm, it, like in society, to tell people or tell ourselves, oh, you tell fine. children, yeah. you fight, especially for children, because a child's worries, a child's concerns, like things going wrong for them, are incredibly minor in the grand scheme of it normally, but. For us, they're minor. For them, it's catastrophic. The end of the world. Exactly, yeah. But and, but you've got to understand how patronising it is towards children. And they are human beings. And they're, like we always say, we're learning for experience. So they are constructing their own concept of, and their conceptual framework. And that's so if you suddenly start about. telling them, oh, when you feel like this, which is a level of sadness, or what they equate with sadness. Everyone's going to say you're okay. Yeah, then you just learn to bottle it up a little bit. When in reality, we don't, the one thing we want to be doing is not teaching children to bottle up. Their feelings, we want to be encouraged it to be normal to talk about our feelings, etc. Et exactly. And I think that is one thing that I did mention in that video. Um, have a look back on our social medias because it will be there. And um, it's we wouldn't say that to an adult who's just been through something horrific. No, no. When someone if someone was having a panic attack, for example, you wouldn't say, You're all right. Well, any layer of trauma, really, isn't it? Yeah, and you wouldn't fob them off. No. You might sit them down and say, You are safe, you are with me. We are okay like in this environment. You talk through it. But we need to give children that same level of respect. And that's what the positive mental health class is all about. It's about recognising mental health and helping children to build a positive mental health as well. Um, but I think that if you struggle to look after your own mental health, you're going to struggle to help a child with their mental health. And that's huge as well. And all the techniques that are used in that I talk about in the class or anything we talk about on social medias and things, can be transferred to adults as well yeah. because we can all do count to five by finger breathing whatever it is that you're doing it's um it can be transferred as adults we all have our own way of dealing with things and i sometimes think it's important to talk about your own mental health struggles like i've struggled with my mental health for i feel like years and years and years and i don't always have a hold on it but i feel like i'm better at recognizing than i was like 10 years ago. Mm. So I think it's just understanding what works for yourself and children don't know that yet. No, because so they, they haven't developed no. enough. It's called predictive error, isn't it? Yeah, when you get yeah. to it and you're not sh sure and you make mistakes or you make errors in either judgment yeah. or understanding. But through co-regulation, children will learn what works for them as individuals. Language and co-regulation in early years can never be underestimated yeah uh, the, the importance around co-regulation and helping children to develop and through experience yeah. partnering them in that experience co-regulation isn't being an emotional bodyguard and playing that game of oh you're fine you're fine like even if it's coming from a really caring place that isn't co-regulation and co-regulation can sometimes be allowing children to experience upset disappointment those types of feelings yeah. because you could only, if you if you're shadowed away from it, if you're in bubble wrap and you never experience it, you don't learn how to deal with it. No. And you don't learn like like I say, those valuable experiences your brain needs later to help it predict and understand what's going on. And then also the prediction of what to do as a response exactly. of it. Um so it is really important to it's a hard one to say it's important to let children be upset. There's a fine it's line. Like, you have to allow children to feel those emotions. Mm. Don't hide them from those emotions. But then they also need to learn that people who care for them and love them exactly are there. to help them. And that, yeah. That's 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 the crux of it. Um, and then and then, you, and, then sorry, and then we often inevitably can then start talking about 
from that emotional response, we could start talking about behaviour and you go down that path. Go that path, yeah. Um, and then when we talk about adults, we wanted to touch upon social media because even though in the early years it's not something that we are, children really should be having access to is social media. Um, most children know how to swipe notifications away when they watch them on YouTube. But this one is more for adults in early years. There's so much online, like so much. And... I always see videos of like influencers and things that get negative. Like it's such horrible, horrible comments on videos. Mm. Um, and I do stand with the, yes, you put yourself on social media, at, like fine, but it doesn't give someone the right to just be nasty. I always have a thing where if you wouldn't say it and deliver it like that in real life to yeah. somebody you were just having a chat with, don't do it on social media. No. Because if you're not going to, I mean, there's some people probably who would stand there and do it in real life, but in the gun scheme. Across, uh, like, you get quite angry with footballers. Yeah. But you wouldn't. Oh, there's a fine line. That you absolutely. wouldn't stand in front of them and call them some of the things that people call them online. No, and, and I could say things about my private house, but like, oh, so and so is rubbish. But in real life, he's actually really, really good and significantly <laughs> better than I am and probably yeah. a really nice guy. Absolutely. So I think in terms of social media, social media plays a massive part with mental health. People on social media usually show the good. And I think we're starting to see people show more of the realities of their lives and that not everything is sunshine and rainbows because it's not always. I think I, f I have said, and people always say this is a bit of a, 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 a said in every generation, but I do think kids going to now have it hard. Oh, I agree. Because you get it from all angles. Like you can't escape that feeling of looking at other people and, and that is a truth. I mean, you're a teenager, you're incredibly, majority of them are incredibly self-conscious because you go through that phase. It's changing. Uh, yeah, and your yeah. hormones are so high and the hormone levels are over the place. Like there's a lot going on biologically and it's a tough to deal with. And then having social media as a constant presence, even when you shut your door and, and you're in your bedroom on your own, it's still there. It's there. As a, as a, and like you said, everything on it is... Everyone's Look living their best I'm lives. The best, the best. Yeah. And now you've got this, you've got trends of obviously girls can always see, you know, girls who look incredible and they don't realise the absolute lengths and hours that they're putting in the gym or like there's always context behind it. Yeah. Then you've also got, now you've got this wave of masculinity that's sort of come on. You've got individuals on social media portraying this harsh, stoic version of men in society. And it's just the extremes are everywhere. Yeah. Because in reality, people aren't really like that. People battle their emotions and they and people now say the most ridiculous things and outlandish things just because it gets views and just because it garners yeah. attention. And when you're 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, your brain doesn't stop developing until you're what, 25? I mean, yeah. it's a lot. They're so impressionable to what is out there. I think um, the term FOMO is so real. Yeah. Because if you don't know what FOMO is, fear of missing out. Um, like it, All right, Emily, know, trendy little individual. The lingo. Yeah. Um, but that is so true, and mm -hmm. I think it doesn't stop. There's always... Like, I see things on social media, and I'm like, oh, I wish I was there, like, I wish I was doing that. Or if... For example, last August, we were on a lovely family holiday in the sunshine in Turkey, and I missed my friend's birthday celebrations. I missed two celebrations in that week. It was two birthdays, one week, then the next. And I missed both of them. I was having the best time ever on holiday, but I still saw those pictures on social media of all my friends hanging out about me and I was like, oh, missed it. It doesn't yeah. stop. Yeah. Even though I am on holiday, drinking cocktails, having beautiful food with the sea and the pool, having the best time of my life, you still get that gut feeling when you see something you're not involved in of, oh, like, and it's, it's further than that. I mean, I, was, I saw something on social media the other day. It was a chap who was talking about the fact that he had no... He's, I think he was 23, some other video, 22, uh, and he has no friends, or that's what he was talking about anyway. Yeah. Um, and I think that can be really hard nowadays because... Making friends as an adult yeah. is so difficult. And, and I think making friends in general is really hard now because if you come from school and you move away, you go somewhere else, it's, it's, it's very difficult to yeah. make friends unless you're lucky that you got work colleagues or you happen to find people through something that you're interested in, be it sport and stuff. We are living in a world where we're so self-absorbed probably yeah. more than ever and we're reliant on technology I mean you could almost if you work from home now you can almost live your life and never leave your house you yeah. can get shopping yeah, delivered to your house you work from your house like and that's not good for your mental health either. no not at all and the ideas of like community and stuff like well, we you could almost live in your house now and never talk to your neighbours and yeah. once upon a time you'd know everybody who lives 
we don't talk to our neighbours. Oh, well, they've talked to the other ones. <laughs> um, I think it's, and that's really important, actually. We talked we talked a long time ago, I can't remember what episode it was, about the fact that we are social beings. Mm. Human beings mm. learn through social experiences and that's what fills our cups up. And that's how we learn through experiences, being sociable. And when you don't have that, oh my gosh, during COVID, there was a point, I remember, I was talking to my about this the other day, there was a point where I didn't leave the, my flat for five days. I didn't see a single yeah, soul yeah. for five days, apart from the person I was living with. And she was like, you need to go for a walk. <laughs> you need to go get a fresh air. But I just couldn't bring myself to do it. I'd got into that rut and I was like, I don't want to leave the house. Yeah. I wasn't scared of COVID. I was just so down. And I got to the point where she was sitting, she ringed me like, please go for a walk. <laughs> please get out. Get out of the get house. Get out of the house. Sorry. Because you need to do something. The thing is though, it was so hard for that, wasn't it? Lockdown, yeah. And that whole time period. And I still wonder if that has knock-on effects, like long-term knock-on effects. Because think about it. That guy who I was talking about, if he was 22, 23, where, how long ago is lockdown? Like six years? So he would have been in around that age. And he would have missed out on so much as a result of it. And I think, no, again, I feel like if I'd have missed out my 18 experiences, I'd have been all right. <laughs> no, but there is, there is scientifically, when you talk about motivation, yeah. you talk about engagement and stuff like that, we have always had the old intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. But scientifically, one of the things they are proving more and more is, is there is a word for it. And I was just trying to find it then, and I can't remember, but it's almost wanting that. Um, praise let's say from other people but from a social standpoint yeah social praise and being involved in a community and being accepted like they're massive driving factors pay is a huge one of course but when we're talking about motivation we you label it extrinsic and intrinsic i mean it's always all intrinsic because even an extrinsic i.e uh, an external and the reason why I'm, uh, I'm doing a stem class currently which will be probably coming out next week and motivation is a massive part of that but when we're talking about even external things, it is an internal drive that's making you want that external external thing. Because we often disagree around sticker charts in early years. And I always understand what you mean because technically that is an external and and the best way to develop motivation is always to have it internally. But even the sticker chart and your want for that object, wherever it might be, is internal. Is is internal. You're getting a dopamine response. Yeah. Which is your brain's... And I'm not saying sticker charts work for everyone but they do work for some kids. No, no, but that's, that's the thing. But... Even that, you think of it, oh, a sticker chart, and then you go and you can categorize to form some motivation. But that sticker is technically, like I've just spoken about, a form of social acceptance. Yes. Because it's, it's at, it, the child probably doesn't really give that much of a shit about the sticker, but it's actually the praise. It's that, that person singling you out and telling you, well done. Yeah. And then what that, that sticker represents is I'm part of this community, society, sort of. That sounds very deep and high level, but. Do you know what I'm trying to say? say? Yeah. And, and that's when that positive mental health gets built because they've got praise and those chemicals are being released and it's all very nice and positive. I mean, we can dive into motivation and talk about the different parts of the brain and what releases dopamine. Yeah. And you can go to that level and then you can talk about extra... Like money is another... It's like money is technically the sticker from earlier. The difference is money has a lifestyle reward. It releases really things. Was it, yeah. But I was looking at a study that was really interesting and it actually showed that... If you take anxiety versus motivation, anxiety wins. Because they showed in in, in, in in scenarios and through testing, those that had like the most to lose, for example, mm-hmm. like i.e. Um, the prize money was higher versus lower, the ones actually in the lower band performed best in the tasks yeah. because they weren't crippled by anxiety. Again, you can link it back to sport. Often some of the worst performances from some of the best players come at those moments in time where the yeah. most pressure is on you. Like, for example, in training, they can nail a penalty like time after time after time. Suddenly, it's the World Cup final. You've got 90,000 people watching you. And my man misses the target completely. Oh, I know who you're talking about. <laughs> Cause, but he's ripped with anxiety. Because it outweighs like, the motivation to win that. He desperately wants that trophy. But anxiety wins over. won over it, yeah. yeah. And that's why I think, uh, like in that scenario, I think you'd be both talking about Saka. I wasn't, you but that, that was the person who flashed in front of my eyes when I started saying it. Heartbreak. But the abuse that he got from missing that penalty... On social media. I think he was... I'm talking about mental health when it comes into that. Yeah. But um, that is what we were talking about to begin with. Yeah, I know. Sorry. (laughs) Um, It's... um, He was 19, I think, at the time. Yeah. I mean, God, it was a long time ago now. I I still reflect him as being quite young. Yeah. yeah. But I think he was 19 at the time. And there's grown adults calling him 
all sorts of horrific names and it was like it was awful i mean most of that though comes on social media doesn't it the faceless oh 100% but still come on if you if you're a person that sits behind a screen or a fake account and writes those things to people i think you really need to go and get yourself some help uh, yeah I, I, like, I, genuinely like this is from me now like go and talk to someone about your feelings yeah but go i go to I, therapy I because do, they have everyone to, should do therapy they have to do more in, in social media land you do I don't know have, how I don't know how you do more because you could make up fake different all sorts of everything no but you have to have, you, they are going to at some point have to surely create a some sort of ID yeah so if you want to sign up to Twitter or whatever the hell it's called now you have to have it has to be linked to your online ID card maybe yeah and I know there's a whole people will be able to point out some GDPR like massive yeah. flaws like I understand that what I've probably said is quite naive but there has to be something to govern it otherwise it's just I hate Twitter nowadays, which should be, but it should be a really nice thing to be able to communicate with people from all over the world on something you're interested in. But it just gets full of absolute shite, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Um, but yeah, I think today we kind of wanted to touch upon like just a nice light chat. We've had quite a few heavy conversations over the last few weeks. We had gender nice and light time. chat about down the <laughs> government for banning sex education. Get up the pitchforks for this nice light topic. No, it, but in terms of the way we've chatted about it, yeah. it's quite we've kept it light and breezy. We had gender stereotypes and then yourself and uh, Claudio talked about men in childcare, which got quite heavy as well. That was a really, really interesting conversation as well. Thank you. So if you've not listened to last week's podcast, check it go out. and check it out. Um, so I just wanted to kind of touch on a heavy topic in a light way and mental health is real it's important and if you're not feeling okay talk to someone that you trust um the thing is there's no way to combat like if you're a parent listening to this there is no right or wrong way that you can help your child not have demons around social medias demons with the perception of themselves yeah. like there's, there's no oh if you do this it won't happen that's, that's not gonna occur and life's tricky and being a teenager is incredibly tricky I think the best bet and the best is always just try and raise a child that is proud of who they are, regardless yeah. of anything going on. And and what I was always told, if you've not got anything nice to yeah. say, don't say it at all. I think the cool... Smile like, and walk away. You're always worried about being the cool kid in school and stuff, and et cetera, et cetera. But being cool is just being nice. Like, and as an adult, you finally get that. I yeah. think sometimes you lose that when you're in school. Yeah. But you look back and you think, man, I just, I just could have been solid in myself in being just a nice, nice human person. being. Yeah, because that's that's been cool. Yeah, I agree. That's a nice way to end this right. episode. I feel I, I well, feel like I sounded like a dad saying that. You did. <laughs> you looked like a dad yesterday when you walked with your and retro lead shirt. Um, okay, that's us for this week. Yeah, be nice. Be nice. Be kind. Um, and look after yourself as well. Yeah. Not look after yourself. That sounds. That sounds like. Yeah, take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. Yeah, I agree. Um, do something this week that's going to make you feel good. Yeah. And release some dopamine in your head. Yes, and we will see you next week. We'll do. Bye. Bye.